All right. Given that this is an exam review day, we can uh, keep things pretty loose and pretty uh, simple. And, and to be clear, I kind of think that this exam, I've said this before and I'll say it again, um, I, I, I've taught this class every, pretty much every spring since I've been at Marshall, and historically this has been the easiest of the three exams. Um, arguably some of the uh, or, or one of the easier exams I give, period. Like it's, I mean, bolts and welds, I hope that the class would agree is not complicated. Uh, it really isn't, you know, it's pretty straightforward. But we're gonna go through the material, we're gonna go through the, the concepts um, and open it up for questions. Uh, in terms of logistics, so the last two assignments are being graded and homework 4.2 is due today. The solution should be up, so you should have all these solutions uh, available for, um, for review for the exam. Let's talk about the exam. Let's talk about logistics and uh, content. So logistics, um, it's no different than the last exam, uh, and the remaining two exams are going to be the same. Um, conceptual questions and computational problems. There'll be three computational problems. I'll tell you one of them is going to be a bolt problem. One of them is going to be a weld problem. The other one, I'm not sure yet. I haven't uh, uh, finalized that yet. Uh, but no more than four to five short answer computational questions. Um, one of the things I would suggest, um, and, and uh, maybe there's not a lot to it, but I did record a video on teams for going through the exam one statistics, and I did have some suggestions for the class. Honestly, in this class, wasn't really a lot, but it's things like make sure that, you know, when you do a calculation that maybe, you, you know, double check it, you know, because, I mean, Every single exam I give, if all the calculator mistakes were gone, the class average would bump up a couple points just immediately. So, you know, if you plug numbers into the calculator, like just double check it, you know, maybe do it again to see if you're getting the same answer. Um, but like those are, those are like low hanging fruit correctable issues and whatnot. The other obviously time management, don't spend a hundred uh, 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 percent of your time on a problem that's worth 5% on the exam, but again, I think that's pretty straightforward. Uh, in terms of the topics, this is what's on the exam right here. <laughs> this is it. So bolted connections, make sure you can understand the fundamentals of uh, bolt installation, bolt behavior, and be able to analyze and design either bearing type connections or slip critical connections. That's it. Uh, welded connections, understand the fundamentals of welding methods and welding behavior, and be able to analyze and design connections using fillet welds. That's it, you know, that's, that's the exam. Um, in terms of the greatest hits on formulas and equations, so for bolted connections, our capacity can basically be summarized in this one slide. This is it. So um, we have bolt shear and bolt slip, which can both be looked up in respective tables in the spec. Those are tab worthy, you know. I don't think you need two tabs for each table because the, the tables are literally one page apart, you know, like, you turn to this table, literally turn the page, and you're on this table. So as long as you can find one of them, you can find the other pretty easily. That's definitely tab worthy, okay? For bolt bearing capacity, there's not really anything to tab, but it is a fairly rote plug and chug expression. So in order to do bolt bearing capacity, I'm, I kind of have the formulas backwards, but um, the first thing that you should do is compute the hole diameter, then compute your LCE and your LCI, uh, and then from those, compute 1.2 LCE TFU, 1.2 LCI TFU, and then the bottom expression. And then the nominal capacity of an edge bolt is the minimum of these two for LCE, and the nominal capacity of an interior bolt is the minimum uh, of these two for LCI. And so you have an edge bolt capacity, you have an interior bolt capacity, so sum up your edge bolts, sum up your interior bolts, there's your RN, don't forget to multiply by phi. That's it in a nutshell. So like for this connection, you'd have four edge bolts, 16 interior bolts. There's your capacity check, your layout check. So you have minimum and maximum bolt spacing requirements. These are the two that you're going to utilize for, um, for assessing a connection. So in other words, if you have a connection and you need to determine whether or not it fits within prescribed requirements, you're going to check between minimum and maximum. If you're designing a connection, you're either going to use minimum or preferred. Uh, and you're not going to have to guess that. I will tell you that, okay? Because that, that, there's no value in me uh, uh, having to grade two different sets of connections that are both right according to the spec. So uh, you'll know that. 
Edge distance requirements, that's probably not a bad table to tab either. This is table J3.4, which lists the minimum edge distance requirements. Remember, those are the ones that come from the fabricators so that um, when you drill or uh, punch a hole or use a CNC or what have you to generate a hole in a plate, that you actually have a well-maintained geometry. So there's no like hard and fast rule like there is, say, for minimum bolt spacing because if the bolts get too close together, you know, the, the, you can't get a wrench around them. So you can actually determine what that minimum spacing needs to be based on bolt geometry, and that's actually a pretty simple plug and chug expression. Uh, if minimum spacing requirements, if minimum connection uh, 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 layout requirements are for fabrication uh, 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 facilitation, if you will, maximum layout requirements are for corrosion prevention, right? Because if the bolts get too far apart, we can get water in between there, and water causes corrosion, and and you know where that's going from there. For designing a bolted connection, um, the process is pretty straightforward. So we determine our factored load. We determine the capacity of a single bolt. And this step two is really what changes between a bearing type connection and a slip critical connection. So a bearing type connection, we're just using the shear capacity. And for slip critical, we're using the shear or the slip capacity, whichever one governs. We compute the capacity of a single bolt, divide to get the number of bolts, and then we, I say, select a pattern accordingly. So, you know, making sure that you have a, a well-grouped uh, arrangement of bolts. Um, in terms of laying it out, we're going to use LE min typically, and either S min or S preferred to lay it out. Uh, and then when it's all done and you have a connection, you do need to check the bolt bearing capacity because just because you're making uh, meeting layout requirements doesn't mean you have uh, enough bolt bearing capacity. And dependent upon the connection, there have been scenarios where bolt bearing governed, you know. So a lot of times we have, you know, a shear capacity of 300 kips and a bearing capacity of 800 kips. But sometimes that's not the case, so you do need to check. If that fails, you need to iterate if necessary. And we talked in our, um, in, in one of our previous lectures about ways of improving your uh, bolted connection. Um, the, I would say the, the, most efficient way is to probably up your bolt spacing a little bit. I mean, even just taking your bolt spacing and upping it by half an inch, you'd be surprised how much bolt bearing capacity you can get out of that. To be clear, I am not, and this is not an exam where iterating over and over again is going to achieve significant value in in the the, the the process, right? It's not like, um, you know, it's not a process where the iteration itself is the point, like a a moment distribution method or a hardy cross approach where you you like that's the whole point is the iteration that this is that that's not really the point here so i'm not intending for you to have to do a bunch of iteration for this weld uh welded bleh, welded connection capacity we have the weld metal capacity and the base metal capacity the weld metal capacity very plug and chug the 0.707 comes from trig the 0.6 comes from our von mises yield criterion everything else you can look up directly from the spec or from sorry from your problem uh, electrode strength, weld size, etc. This is if you're analyzing. Uh, base metal capacity, just plug and chug, makes it really easy for welded, for fillet welded connections because the gross area and shear and the net area and shear are equal, right? You don't have to worry about that. Um, uh, you don't have to, like, like you did for block shear, I guess I should say. Like with block shear, you had to remove the bolt holes from the gross area and shear to get the net area and shear. We're talking about a welded connection. There are no bolt holes. So, so yeah. Weld size limits, um, similar to bolted connection layout requirements, there are weld size limitations that don't really have anything to do with strength per se. I mean, they indirectly have something to do with strength, but they're really more focused on, again, fabrication uh, tolerances. So for example, we have minimum weld sizes to try and avoid the heat sink effect. If you've got a really thick plate and a really small weld, that plate can rapidly absorb that energy. And guess what? By golly gosh, gee, you have a brittle weld because of the heat sink effect. Maximum weld sizes, basically what we're trying to do is ensure that the plate maintains its geometry, that we're not melting the top of the plate, and that when we place a fillet weld, that it does maintain that sort of 45, 45, 90 geometry. If we melt the tip of the plate, uh, then the weld will start to have an odd geometry, and we kind of want to avoid that. For designing a welded connection, um, the process is very sim similar to a bolted connection. We're going to determine the factored load. We're, uh, we have a little bit of an intermediate step because we have to choose a weld size based on weld limitations. So with bolts, we're 
we're usually given the bolt size at the beginning of the, the, the problems that we've been doing on homework or uh, exams. Now, in the real world, you might, you're obviously probably not going to be given a bolt size, but what you're going to be do, using is, you know, commonly available bolts. So like, arguably, the most common bolt size is a three-quarter inch diameter bolt. So I can tell you just about any connection that I would design as a steel designer, that's probably at least where I would start. And if it got to be too many bolts, I maybe would up it up to seven-eighths or an inch. All right, but with welds, we have to choose a weld size. What we're going to do is choose the weld size based on weld limitations. Um, and what might seem a little counterintuitive is that we typically want to choose the largest weld size, but up to 5 16 because anything past 5 16 we'd have to use more than one weld pass to deposit that weld, and that's going to be more expensive. Um, but we choose the largest weld size because the largest weld size means the shortest weld length, and which typically means a more economical connection. Once we have a weld size, we can determine the capacity per connector, much like we did with bolted connections, but the connector is going to be an inch of weld. So we determine the capacity of an inch, divide to get the total number of required inches, and then we just lay out the connection. So we usually lay it out in a symmetric fashion. We talked about instances where we might use a balanced weld. We're not going to have balanced welds on the exam, so don't worry about that. Um, but we, uh, we will limit the weld lengths to the nearest inch. So I believe on your homework assignment, you had a problem where you had to round up to the nearest inch on one of your layouts. So I'm just doing nearest inch so that we all kind of get the same answer and it's simple. Um, and use either longitudinal welds or longitudinal plus transverse welds. Never a transverse weld by itself. It has low ductility. That's it. That is your content on exam two. All right. Now I'm going to shut up and see what questions you have for me on this rainy day. Yes, yes, it's always the number. I didn't hear the day that you said that. And yeah. We started an exam when you're just like, you know, who was listening? I was like, definitely wasn't me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so if you are given E90 electrodes, just for the sake of discussion, then FEXX is 90 KSI. That, I mean, that's what that number means. It is the classification. So, yeah, there's, there's no, like, trick there. Yes, sixteenth of an inch. Yes, I would say that if you're starting to get to like big welds, you know, like a three-quarter inch weld, that you might start upping it by an eighth of an inch. But again, those are pretty uncommon welds in most structural applications. To be clear, there are places where we might use a weld that big, like a, let's say maybe I don't know, like a column base plate connection, where okay. That's got a lot of force on it. We need a beefy weld, and there's not a lot of room. Um, but you're not going to see that everywhere. Like every routine beam with column connection, it's not going to look like that. So. In today's homework, did you use one of the 516 for the web pass? I think I did. It, I built, so here's why I say I think I did. I posted, it was not last weekend, but it was the weekend before. I basically just sat in front of my desk and built the entire class up through spring break. So I don't remember because <laughs> I built the everything a few weeks ago. Um, but I'm pretty sure that was what I was testing because I think if I'm correct, the A max went past 516. Yeah. It was like 3 eighths or something or yeah. something like that. It was about 3 eighths. It was like 0.39 or something. So, something like that. So the point was, yeah, it was something like that. So the point was was that you would use 5 sixteenths. Yeah, because 5 sixteenths is 0 0.3125. Because that was a, a, a web thing. Or, uh, yeah, that was the. I think we got like 14 or something. It's a little bit over. A little bit, yeah, that was the point, yeah. So that you would know to cut it off there. And I think in the end, you got a pretty, re if I remember correctly, wasn't it something like it was like 9, 9, and 9, or 9, 10, and 10, something like that? What, wasn't it that, or? I did 9, 11, 11. Was some, it was something, I don't, it was, it was square. I remember it was very close to being square at the end. It wasn't exactly square. I think it was a little off. I, I can't remember. Oh, I had 9, 12, and 12. Okay. I, because I looked up the depth of the two screws, and it couldn't even be done. Yeah, that, that, that was the other point I was, was trying to make with that problem, is that if you're going to use a transverse weld, 
you got to know the depth of the channel to figure out the length of the well. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, I'm going to give you a generic answer that you're not going to like, um, but it's the best answer I can give you. Okay. So, I want to talk. To answer that, I need to talk about fee values in general. Okay. So, what happens with a fee value is this, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to. I don't want to get too far down statistics land because that's. Actually, where we're going is probability and statistics land. But what we do whenever we develop fee values, there, there's, it's a process called calibration. Okay? But basically what you're doing is you're saying, okay, here's my loads. right? So I've got dead loads. Dr. Bryce loved this stuff, right? You've got dead loads, right? Dead loads are normally distributed, right? Then you've got live loads, which are extreme type 1 distributed, right? You use different probability distributions for different phenomena, right? Okay. There's also different probability distributions for resistances, right? So maybe your, I don't know, your yielding phenomenon is log normally distributed, and then your your fracture phenomenon uses this distribution. Like log normal is very common for resistance distributions, but to, to give you kind of an idea. So what we do is we have a load function, and then we have a resistance function. What we then do is we develop a limit state function, which is resistance minus loads, right? And then we plot that, right? Now, what, we, what happens is when we plot that, we get this region where the curve goes negative. And where the curve goes negative is where the, the element is susceptible to failure. Now, now, these are probability distributions, right? The bell curve, as an example, it goes on forever. Right? It goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. So what you're trying to do is you're not, there's no such thing as, if you think about it in those terms, there's no such thing as designing a structure that's perfectly safe. You can't do that. What you can do is design a structure so that it has a known probability of failure. With me so far? Okay. So here's my point. So the way that we do that is we take those loads and resistances and we adjust them, right? So we get, we take the dead loads, for example, we up them by 1.2. We take the live loads, we up them by 1.6. The resistance, well, it depends on what resistance that we're talking about, right? Maybe tension member yielding, we bump that down 0.9. Maybe tension member fracture, we bump that down 0.75. But maybe shear yielding, we don't need to bump down at all in order to achieve a uniform level of safety. D does that make sense? So that it... There are reasons beyond that. You know, we could start getting into more of the statistics, we can get more into the policy discussions because what we're trying to achieve is a target probability of failure, a target uniform level of safety. There are instances where we want that level of safety to be maybe a little higher, you know, like for main members versus connections, but that's kind of the best answer I can give you without turning this into a reliability course. Reli structural reliability is a whole class in and of itself. We could talk all day long about how limit states are developed, how we come up with 1.2 and 1.6, but that's the best answer I can give you without turning it into uh, 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 Dr. Bryce's dream seminar. Yeah. I'm joking, but this is stuff that he and I could talk about for ages. So, yeah. Did that answer the question for everybody else? I want to make sure that that answer was a, was a good response for everybody, because that was a good question. Now, of course, I'm going to uh, ask a question very much like that on the exam. You need to answer it in like five words or less. I'm not going to ask a question conceptually that complicated on the exam. Nudge, nudge. What's that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's a really fun topic to get into like advanced probability like the probability and statistics relevant to engineers. There's actually some really cool stuff in there because um, like when you take a stat three forty five class, you're covering general stuff that applies to everybody. 
But when you get to the stuff that's relevant for engineers, it's actually really cool stuff. So. Why does a bed want to fill its wells look exactly the same on the symbol? What? Bevel and a Phillips weld look exactly the same. So if we're writing it when it's down, it looks like a, a bevel. Oh, I'd have to, I'd have to show you an example on on where it's where they put the symbol. But I, again, I'm not going to have you, um, I'm not going to have you do anything beyond fill it weld symbols. Don't, don't. I was like, am I writing? No, no, no! You're not writing it wrong. There, I'll have to, sh I'll have to show you. So, I'll, I'll find an example. I get what you're saying, but they're, they're different. So, if I'm being honest, it's been a while since I've done drawings that had like groove weld symbols, and I, I can't remember exactly how it done. I think it, it's like encircled or emboxed, and it's different. So, I can't remember, but. How are we feeling about the exam? Is there anything about the exam that's making you nervous? Is there anything about the exam that you're unsure about? Like, I'm going to have some wax and solvent for Ed's again. I think I'll be okay. <laughs> you're, put it on there, no. that's all so. Does the S stand for salty? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> Engineers doing algebra. Dr. Mike, that was in high school. We skipped that class. We went straight to Dr. <laughs> 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 <I'm sorry. laughs> you were just very plain about the way you said that. Oh, because I meant it. Engineer. Yeah. I I have I have considered um may it, it depends on whether or not I have time, but I have considered maybe over the summer doing like a some short videos on like sort of like fundamental crash course for engineers like how to do unit conversions you know basic trig basic algebra you know um, I don't know if it would be beneficial or not no but I'm 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 going on a tangent I know No, it. I think I have more problems with the other than that little reserve thing from the junior. Well, it, it is meant more for like freshmen and <laughs> first years and sophomores and whatnot. So. You make any money off YouTube? <laughs> you know, because they're not in YouTube. But he doesn't model that. Where are you gonna turn comments back on? Cock. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened with that? He said he told us last semester, but I forget. I had <laughs> like, comment, subscribe. So I, <laughs> I had a um, uh, a a very kind uh, <laughs> viewer that <laughs> that left a lot of comments that were maybe a little distracting to everybody else. And to be clear, like I, I have. What what ends up happening more often than not is I'll have people just like find my email address and send me an email and say either like thanks or like I'll get one of three messages. I'll either get thanks, I'll get can I get your lecture slides? Or every now and then they'll catch an error. They'll say, Oh, you have a typo on this, you know, and I don't tell you all about this because it'll add to the tally, you know, mark or whatnot. <laughs> but I mean Well, but usually what I do is well, if you no, what I people will end up finding me, and what'll happen is if there's a uh, if there's an error, I'll put like in the video description, I'll say there's an error in at 42 minutes, and then. I do, yeah. It, 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 I don't. I mean. I'm not that interesting. Like, I apparently, Tracy does an 
That would be a downvoted view. <laughs> Here's me grading homework. I get stuck in channels. Like Dr. Mike or some game. Or Dr. Mike reacts to other lectures. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I have philosophical, deep seated problems with the game Polybridge that I could talk all day long about. Yeah, we'll Please. just. <laughs> we'll <laughs> <laughs> like, they have a bridge with with a a, a an elevated portion supported uh, supported by a hot air balloon. I Come on, like what are we talking about here? I want you to go through and play the entire game on YouTube. And every issue you find oh there. goodness, that would be a pain. That would that would be painful for me. I so would like comment <laughs> you would like comment. We would all like comment. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh goodness, I actually. I thought about last year doing my lectures on Twitch. I was very tempted to do that, but the honest pro there were two problems that I had. One, um, I actually was I re and, and I didn't come up with that idea until like we were getting ready to start the semester, so I ended up not doing it. I actually was trying to figure out how do I take attendance because like how do I know that you are Yankees fan 42 like how do I know that and and I guess the other thing that I was concerned about is like if other people show up and then just start and they, what I, I don't have a problem with people watching it but if we're there in class live and somebody starts like spamming like you know stuff in the chat I'm like <laughs> now, I, I actually thought about that because I thought it would be more accessible to everybody. Like, it would be easier to access. But um, I also, from what I understand, there's a delay that we, the, the delay on Twitch was actually more than the delay on Collaborate. So I thought it didn't make sense. So that's why I didn't do it. streams <laughs> that's not what I have to worry about apparently apparently I'm there in in my second floor office and what like a SWAT team shows up or something <laughs> like I'm just talking about bolts like <laughs> we're just doing moment diagrams like what are you talking about oh man our conversation got way past steel design um, Let's let's wrangle it back to the world seals. Any questions? All right, let's let's take welds. Any particular welding questions that, um, you know, so proverbially burning a hole in your pocket? What's that? So when you get the stack weld, so like a three quarter inch weld, does that? You're talking about build to weld and multiple passes. Yeah, does that do any kind of compromise to the strength of it, or is like an ideal weld to just? The short answer is no. Um, I mean, a couple things to keep in mind. It's not just anybody placing a weld. I mean, you have to go through weld certification to understand the appropriate heat inputs. And, you know, you, you also go, I mean, welds like that are also going to be inspected. They're going to do magnetic testing and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of QA, QC built into ensuring that the weld is going to perform the, the way that we in, uh, intend it to. The actual layering, I mean, not really, if I'm being honest. There's another thing to consider, okay? Um, and and it, I want to be clear on some of the, the, the data that we use. Let's take grade 36 steel. What is the yield stress? What, 36 KSI? What do you think that 36 actually means? Do you think that's the average for A36 steel? I, if it's the average, then why does everyone struggle and have a range? Let me, let me ask you this about the average. If it's the average, then half the steel that we produce has a yield stress less than 36 KSI, which means half the yield stress, uh, the grade A36 steel we produce in the United States is going in the trash. Grade thir the, the 36 KSI is the minimum. If you take a piece of 36 KSI steel right now, grade A36, and go test it, it'll probably... 
um, exhibit yield stresses well beyond 36. You'll probably be in the 40, 50 range. You know? That's just the number we can hang our hat on. And the same is true of a lot of instances in our world, right? So it's something to, that's also something to keep in mind is that more often than not, your strength is well above this. It's just this is what we can hang our hat on. Th this is one of the things that does sort of bug me a little bit sometimes in structural engineering, which is your this happens all the time. When you are doing a beam design, let's say in a building, and you do the math, and you do all the calculations, and the math says you should use a W27 by 84. And your boss or supervisor says, let's use one size higher. Why? Like, like why? And I know why they're saying it. They're saying it because they want to have a little bit of extra assurance. And, you know, they, want, they don't want to fall down a killing bay. I, I get that. But there is so much conservatism already built into the spec that there is, I mean, you're following the spec. That's what it's for, you know. Um, if you think that the loads are, you know, underestimated, well, then reperform your estimate. Maybe up the, 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 the initial load assessment. But just to arbor, arbitrarily bump up the member size, it's, it can be a little infuriating because you're starting to talk about real dollars that uh, can, can make a project go up, you know. So, I mean, it's out of the client's pocket, you know. I mean, we do have a, a, a an allegiance to the client as well. I mean, we're. I mean, keep in mind, you are taking the live load that a structure is designed for, and you're upping it sixty percent. That's no joke, you know. That's a lot, you know. I think you're taking a hundred pounds per foot and turning it into a hundred and sixty pounds per foot. That's a lot, you know. So there's already conservatism built into it. So I'm off the soapbox now. You think you're right? Well, one question. Any bolt questions? Yes? Uh, assume include or exclude with the um, uh, bolt design thing. When you went, all right, so if you're told, use what you're told because that it is what it is. If you don't know, you assume included every time because that is the worst case scenario. Um, Typically, during the design phase, like what I would do is if I'm just designing a connection in a building, I would just assume threads included across the board to get a preliminary design. And for me, like if I was designing this building, what I would do is I would design all the connections and all the, the uh, components assuming threads in, uh, included. Then what I would do is start looking at the connections one at a time and go, can I shave a few bolts off this if I can go with threads excluded? You know, and look at the dimensions and see whether or not it's going to work. And if it's not going to work, then don't worry about it. But if it is, I can, you know, delete a couple bolts per connection, then I'm going to do it. But during initial design, threads included across the board. And if you don't know, threads included. Now, one other thing, I, a, a place where I definitely might not tell you is on a slip critical connection because there's two limit states. And so for the bolt shear, you have to figure that out, in which case, include it. Yes, sir? I was just saying, wouldn't it be just smarter just to keep the bolts in there, just for extra security, I guess, instead of like, eh, let's see if we can... Well, keep in mind, again, keep in mind that there's a lot of conservatism already built into it. Yeah. Again, you're taking your bolt shear capacity and dropping it 75%. You know what I mean? So... Um, I mean, if you collect your factor of safety just into one number, there's a big factor of safety already built into uh, the designs that you're doing. And so at what point, like, is it just good enough? You know, there are, let me give you an example, but let me give you an example. Sometimes there are connections that it's actually not even like the, the, the capacity that has the issue. Like, for example, I know that there's small flexural elements in the old building that have two bolts. And it probably has nothing to do with the shear load on the bolts. It's the two-bolt rule per OSHA that's probably end up governing it. That you did the math and you found, oh, the bolts are fine. It's just we're still going to use just two bolts because if we use less, we're going to be violating the OSHA rules. They're like there's an OSHA rule that you can't take the the crane off. Like you're supporting a piece, you're lowering it. You got to have two bolts in before you can take the crane off. Because you, you know, if there was just one bolt, it could fall and hurt somebody. Drawing a line through a well to like describe it, does it matter if you write the stuff above or below the line? 
Uh, it does, but I, I am not going, like, when in doubt, draw as many lines as you need and write below, right? Because below is on the arrow side, right? So if you want, like if you have three welds, just draw three arrows and say that they're all below. You, you know what I mean? That's fine. Um, I'm not going to get worked up over weld symbology. I want you to recognize it, but I'm not going to get worked up over it. So. Any other questions? Are we ending early? All right. On Wednesday, I will be here with the tests, and we will start at 11 on the dot, or we will start early if everybody is, is that, that's supposed to be here is here, OK? So notice how this room doesn't, like, there's people missing, right? So if you want, like, time on the exam, get here. Emoji angry face. We will end at 11.55, okay? So we'll st start either at 11 or earlier if we can. Sound good? We'll start at 11 for the, like, if somebody gets here late, they're late. Like, but if everybody's here before 11, we'll start before 11. Does that make, I mean, does that make sense? Like, to be here on time for your exam, they should know that. Spoken like a true state employee. <laughs> My paychecks say state of West Virginia too, so I, you know, I. This is steel design. You're supposed to think inside the box. <laughs> I thought we were supposed to build the box. There you go. So you have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the philosophy students when we need them? All right, that's all I got, everybody. I will see you all on Wednesday. Best of luck.